Welcome to Injury Law Today, the ultimate podcast for personal injury lawyers. Join us as we explore what it takes to succeed in the highly competitive personal injury space. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with personal injury attorney Cornelius Neal Redman at Redman Law, focusing in personal injury, medical malpractice, and products liability. Welcome, Neil. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Well, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, can you tell us about your background and how you became a personal injury lawyer? Yes. I started out out of college working for Macy's department store. And the reason I'm bringing that up is that it taught me how to really work at marketing. I was very involved with advertising. I was a buyer for them. And I worked for Macy's for about seven years. Then I worked for Ralph Lauren, another retailer, for another three years or so. Then I went to law school. And I went to Cardozo Law School in Manhattan. And after that, I started out as an assistant district attorney in Queens County. My goal with doing that was to um, become a trial lawyer because I always wanted to be a personal injury lawyer. And I knew that the best personal injury lawyers are great trial lawyers. And I was inspired by people like Tommy Moore with uh, Kramer Dilloff, Tessel Duffy and Moore, and a gentleman named Ivan Schneider, who was a fantastic trial lawyer. And so when I started out with the DA's office, my goal was to get as many trials as I could under my belt. And I did um, about 20 trials my very first year. There were misdemeanor trials. And I was really trying to get some experience doing that. My second year, I was working in the Narcotics Bureau. And I did another eight trials there. After that, I started working in the civil area and I worked for the New York State Insurance Department. I did that for uh, another three years, again, trying to make the transition from criminal law into civil law and getting some background with uh, dealing with insurance companies and that sort of thing. After that, I started working for the New York City Transit Authority. Again, I it was a great opportunity for me to learn um, from the defendant's perspective how to fight um, for the plaintiffs, which is what I do right now. And I did that for six years and completed 26 trials on behalf of the Transit Authority before I transitioned over to what they call um, kind of the 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 good side of things as they say the uh the light at the end of the tunnel i finally started doing what i was really hoping to do a bit sooner but was happy i got that background with the trial law through the transit authority and the district attorney's office and worked for a big law firm the biggest law firm in the bronx called Peña and con with over 100 employees and i was a trial lawyer for them and I did about, I'd say, 30 to 40 trials for them in the eight years that I was working for them. And during that time, my marketing experience kicked in that I had learned working with Macy's. And I was able to bring in a lot of cases working for Peña and Khan. The average lawyer working for a firm like Peña and Khan would have three, four, maybe a maximum of 15 cases that they brought in for themselves. Uh, I had at my peak about 175 cases with them. Wow. So it was getting to the point where I was having sort of a law firm within their law firm. And at that point, I decided it made more sense for me to start my own law firm. And I did that about four years ago, just before COVID happened. I had the firm running for about one year and I left a lot of those older cases with the old law firm, Peña and Khan, because I have a very good relationship with those lawyers. But then since that time, now for the past four years, I'm up to almost 1,200 clients wow. that I've brought in that, as you were saying, are mostly um, personal injury cases, 
and medical malpractice. There are a couple of products liability, but my focus is really with personal injury and medical malpractice. Absolutely. So what sets your law firm apart from the others in the industry? Well, two things. Number one is that even though I'm probably considered a bit of an old timer, I'm 59 years old, I actually answer the call when my clients call. Most people at this stage of the game have answering services or they have receptionists that get the phone calls when a new client calls. But I literally pick up the call myself. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm going to be able to evaluate what that person says to me about what happened to them and whether there's a case. And I can do it very quickly, much more quickly than a receptionist or, uh, or an answering service can do it. Number two, I can determine if that person needs immediate attention and I need to personally go to their home or their hospital room. And that's my priority. I will. I leave enough time to myself and I have a big enough staff so that I have that extra what they might call bandwidth or just basically exactly. time to be able to leave and drop what I'm doing and go to the hospital or go to that person's home and meet with them and uh, sign up their case right away and get it going. And if we can't do that, if for some reason um, it's not appropriate for me to come to them or they want to come to our office in downtown Manhattan, I will send an Uber to pick them up and bring them <laughs> into the office. That's we don't, awesome. And we make it happen that day. Absolutely. And then I, and I have a big, I have a pretty good sized staff. I have at least uh, 12 people working for me and I make sure that all of our clients questions are answered rapidly. We have a online portal that allows them to see what stage their case is in at any given time. And I know that can be frustrating for people that aren't don't have great communication with their lawyers or their law firms. They always wanna know what's going on with my case and we make it very easy. And we update that portal so they know the lawsuit was filed. We're getting into the next stage. We're waiting for the answer back from the other side. We are doing the next document called the Bill of Particulars. After that, we're setting up the depositions. After that, we're setting up the case for trial. So at all times, I, I like all of our clients to know exactly what's going on. That's great. Uh, you, you may have just answered this next question and what you just said, but you may, can you elaborate a little bit? Um, how sure. do you approach client intake and case evaluation to ensure the best outcome for your clients? Well, that's very important. Um, we try to take as much information as possible right at the very beginning of the case, and that's critical. And if I myself am going to meet with the client at their home, I'm going, and if they're able, they can walk around with me or they may need some assistance. They're going to show me physically where their accident happened. If it was a staircase, if it was a defective walkway, I'm going to ask them to literally walk with me to that location if they're able. If they're not able, I will literally get onto Google, Google Maps in front of them. I bring my laptop <laughs> with me and we mm -hmm. point, we look for that spot and we look to see if it was in, if it's in existence on that Google map. We look for the defect and I get every particular piece of detail that I can. I also accumulate all of their medical treatment and history. Now that's critical because a lot of times, sometimes people have a prior similar condition that they injured that part of their body okay. on an earlier occasion. And we wanna know that. We Absolutely. wanna find out where they had that treatment, get those records because we're gonna wanna disclose that to the okay. other side. So with the intake, our goal is to be as comprehensive as possible, as specific as possible, and to try to accumulate as much information as possible so we don't have to do it down the road. Uh -huh. In your experience, what are some common misconceptions about personal injury law that you often encounter? Well, the big one is that people call us ambulance chasers, <laughs> and that gives us a negative uh you know, uh, reputation with a lot of people. And really what we're trying to do is just help people out. Um, luckily, we have a system in our United States 
society where if you do get hurt from an incident that wasn't your fault or was primarily somebody else's fault, this gives people the opportunity to be compensated. And a lot of people get very badly hurt and lose time from work and they lose income and they have medical bills that they're not able to pay. And most of all, they have pain and suffering that lasts for quite a while. Even after suit, after the lawsuit's over, we try to get them compensation that enables them to feel that they weren't really uh, taken advantage of. Um, and we get them the best possible outcome so that they they have their needs met into the future. Exactly. And so we're trying not to really, you know, we have some things to overcome because people have that that uh, stereotype. But if you really talk to most personal injury lawyers, you'll send, you'll see that our goal is really to help people. Right. It's not to um, if we can benefit, and we can make a living from it. That's great. But most of us are really interested in getting people, getting them the help they need, getting them compensated. Sometimes people say, oh, well, that was a, a doctor that your lawyer sent you to. And they say, oh, that was just because they wanted you to build up the case. Well, that's not true. I mean, most people that have an orthopedic injury and never had one before don't know where to get treatment. So we have to help them find the best place to get treatment where they'll get they'll get the repair that they need. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, they found injuries that weren't there. That's just not true. People are, our goal is to get the person to feel better and to get them the best possible medical care they can have. Our, our goal is to have a person be made whole again and to be able to walk around and live their lives as if the incident never happened. But, you know, in order to do that, you've got to get the best possible doctors and um, physical therapists and other um, medical providers to really put the person back together again. Our goal is not to have the person get surgery. If they have a, rehab a rehabilitatable um, injury that won't require surgery, that's what we try to do first because that's the best outcome. If somebody can have uh, possibly a partial tear that can be rehabilitated through physical therapy and chiropractic and acupuncture. That's and, and you can have a great outcome that way. That's the best possible result, and we we go for that as our number one priority. If that can't happen, then sometimes we have to move over to surgery, and of course, sometimes people don't have a great result with the surgery either. Mm -hmm. But our goal is to get the person to to be back to the way they were before the incident happened. That's amazing. Can you share a particularly challenging case you've handled and how you overcame uh, any obstacles to reach a successful resolution? Okay, one of the cases that I had that comes to mind right away is a case involving a construction accident. Um, the gentleman, I'm not gonna give you his name, but um, he was walking down a flight of stairs within a construction um, project, and he was carrying a bag of sand on his shoulder, and the stairs that he was walking on gave way, and he ended up falling. Um, basically, his knees crumbled underneath him, and he had a bilateral um, patella tendon ruptures. It was a very serious injury. And the whole thing was caught on a surveillance video. And the um, lawyer for the other side presented us with that surveillance video. And at first glance, the video looked as if my client had um, basically faked his injury because there were these gaps in the video. And it almost looked as though he had um, just walked to that location and then taken a fall almost on purpose. Wow. And what we did was we ended up getting that surveillance video and taking it to an expert that showed that the, the, the way that they had presented it to us was not accurate because <laughs> there were gaps in the video. And although it looked as if my client was faking his fall, 
That was 100% not the case. And our expert was able to piece together the gaps within that video to show that their portrayal of what had happened was completely false and inaccurate. And they were trying to uh, suggest and tell our, you know, say our client was engaging in a fraudulent type of an act. And we showed them through our expert videographer that it was the exact opposite. And that case ended up settling for close to a million dollars. So yeah, that was a that was a nice result. And it just shows you, you know, listen, everybody advocates for their own side. I don't I don't really fault the defendants for saying that, you, you know, at first glance, the video did look negative towards us. But then we have to dig deeper. And we knew in our heart and our soul that our client was a very reliable, trustworthy, um, straightforward individual. And we knew right away that he wouldn't have done anything like that. So we felt confident in pursuing our expert videographer um, who cost us, you know, quite a bit of money to to demonstrate that that was a legitimate um, fall and, and everything worked out well, but we're willing to put the money into things like that. And, you know, listen, if we were to find out that somebody engaged in some type of fraudulent uh, behavior that they claimed resulted in an accident. We don't, we wouldn't take the case. We just drop it, you know, and sorry, but that's just not, you know, the way most lawyers do business. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you stay up to date with the changes and developments in personal injury law? Well, the, the biggest thing that I do as a practitioner is that I am extremely um, uh, active in going into the courtrooms. That is the thing that I really find to be the most beneficial in terms of watching great lawyers and in terms of looking at the newest technology that's used in the courtroom in terms of presenting different types of uh, video presentations, accident recreations. And um, of course, we all have to participate in continuing leg- little, uh, continuing legal education. Mm-hmm. But my greatest, um, I guess, tool for doing that is literally um, finding out when the best lawyers are on trial. And some of these lawyers, um, it's funny because they, I'm on a first name basis with some of the great guys, uh, secretaries. I, uh, Mr. Moore, Tommy Moore's secretary, Marianne, I have her on speed dial and she tells me <laughs> when he's on trial and I take the time. I mean, that to me is a very worthwhile thing. I go and I watch the trial. I form relationships with these gentlemen that I know are doing some things that I want to learn from. And um, I visit the court and I go to the I go to the trials and I watch them cross examine some of the toughest people in the business. And I learn from them. That's really my main way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, How do you balance the need to advocate for your clients with the ethical considerations of the legal profession? Well, that can be tough. You know, Um, the, the, the biggest thing is that. As I was saying before, if we ever make a determination that somebody did something fraudulent or they are presenting their case to us in a way that we feel is not honest, then we have to deliver them the news, which is we're not going to go forward with your your case and represent you. And it, it's tough. I mean, it's it's a struggle from the perspective of giving the client bad news, especially if somebody has a bad injury. And I'm not going to lie. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we're losing out on potentially a very big lucrative fee, but we just cannot, um, we can't go forward with a case where we feel that anything would be um, presented in any kind of a a fraudulent or negative manner that that really isn't the case. Um, And, you know, those are just that's just the hard, cold facts. You know, um, there's there's sort of a it's a, a black and white line, I'd say, in terms of not being able to pass over certain things that you feel just would not be ethically proper to do. And sometimes you have to you know, you have to give the bad news to the client. And, you know, 
usually they kind of know and expect it <laughs> because they're doing something they shouldn't be and they don't really necessarily react um you know but sometimes they get angry and and you know we say well you're free to find other representation but we we just can't do it mm -hmm. Um, so how do you manage and prioritize your caseload um, to ensure that the clients, each client, receives the attention and resources they need? Well, that's a little bit of a tough one, to be honest with you, because I have 1,200 clients right now, and I do I do it two different ways. I look at the case based on the... Um, the, the the priority in terms of new cases, every new case comes in and we go through a checklist for every case that comes in and everything is done with that case in terms of the initial evaluation, the uh, claim letters go out to whoever we feel the defendant is or their, their insurance company. We send out new letters to all of our clients. We make sure that no fault claims are being processed immediately. We set up our statutes of limitations with all of the uh, necessary time frames in terms of the statute of limitations to file a lawsuit, the time limit to file a notice of claim with the city or the uh, transit authority. And we look at it from a chronological point of view, and then we look at it from um from a priority in terms of a value point of view. And I'm not gonna lie, my multi-million dollar cases are gonna get a little bit more attention Absolutely. than maybe a you know $50,000 soft tissue case. So we prioritize the cases in terms of the value. And I look at the top 100 cases every single week in terms of value to make sure that everything is is moving along in a rapid manner and a thorough manner and then as far as all of the other cases they are looked at in, and we have checklists in our software system that allow us to keep track of how many days something has been going without any activity and it's made sure that there's always either a conference happening or a deposition happening on all cases and if that's not the case it's been set up for trial. The what they call the note of issue, otherwise known as the notice of trial, is set up to be done. And once that's done, then the case sort of goes on a little bit of an automatic pilot because once we have the case scheduled for trial, the next step is a pretrial conference and then actually doing the trial. Okay, we got about seven minutes left. I got two more questions. Can you share some sure. tips for individuals? who've been injured in an accident and are considering pursuing legal action? Yes. Um, the biggest thing is that you want to find a law firm that you will be able to communicate with effectively and efficiently, and you'll be able to speak to people that are going to give you the straight scoop on what's going on. And I mean, I give every single one of my clients my cell phone number, which nobody nobody does. And, you know, listen, I have a lot of people that work for me, and I'm not going to tell you that I answer every client's call every time they call me, because I do ask them to call my staff or I'll receive a, a, a voice call or a text message, but everyone gets a return call. That's a guarantee. And you want that in your law firm. And you want results. You want to be with a, a proven, experienced law firm that gets good results and is not going to back down just because the insurance company doesn't want to pay what the initial offer. You know, uh, they're going to make an initial offer. And you don't want an insurance company that just takes a rather law firm that just takes that offer. Absolutely. You want someone that's going to fight and that's going to really analyze and evaluate your injuries and make a determination of what your case is really worth and not back down until you get that value. And if they if they don't get the value, go to trial. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the biggest thing. You're going to want to be able to work with somebody that is willing to go the distance and I've been doing trials, and that's why I told you a little bit about my background. I worked with the DA's office. I worked with the um, the New York City Transit Authority for six years, 
And then I worked on behalf of plaintiffs before I started my own law firm. And my goal had always been to learn how to do the trials and to get great results. So you want to find a law firm that is competent to do that. And most law firms and most lawyers don't do that. They take a settlement and they call it a day. And you, you want someone that's going to be able to feel comfortable going to trial for two reasons. Number one, they're going to go to trial if you need to. But they're also going to let the other side know that, listen, we're ready to go to trial. We're ready to pick a jury. We are ready to um, go the limit on your case. And if you don't take that attitude and you have people that are ready to accept what the insurance company offers, you're never going to get the top value on your case and you're never going to be fairly compensated. Absolutely. Last question. We have four minutes left. What do you see the future of the personal injury law industry and how do you plan to adapt and stay ahead of the curve? I'm not sure about that. It's it's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of changes with artificial intelligence um, getting involved with the, the work that we do. And um, and there's going to be a lot of changes with automated cars. I think there are going to be a lot less accidents with automated cars as that whole process unfolds. And there's also a lot of large law firms that seem to kind of gobble up some of the small mom and pop um, operations. So personally, I am looking to grow my firm. I am 59 years old, but I was just telling my wife the other day, that I don't see myself really retiring until I hit like 75, just because I love it. I love doing what I'm doing, you know? I told her maybe in 10 years I'd slow down a little bit, but I kind of, I, I feel like, uh, so I'm gonna be 60 this year. I personally feel like I'm health-wise and uh, activity-wise, like I'm really 40. So, um, and it's fun. It's, it's a fun business. I love helping people and it's very gratifying and I love doing trials. So um, I'm not sure exactly where the whole business is going to go. Sometimes, you know, we see companies uh, like firms like Morgan and Morgan come into our, into our uh, community. And last year they were advertising like crazy. And then this year I hardly see the, any of their billboards at all. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, I think the key for me as a law firm is to advertise smartly and to build up our reputation so we continue to get word of mouth referrals. Those are the best because Absolutely. those are from our clients. And, and also the internet is really the best and most efficient way for us to advertise because pe people continue to look for lawyers and help on the internet. And we're, our claim to fame that I told you before is that I answer the phone myself. I get on average seven calls a day and I speak to the, the new prospective clients and I tell them the pluses and the minuses. And like I said, if they need our help and they can't get to us, we go to them. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I really enjoyed this podcast. It's been great. Thank you all for joining Injury Law today with our special guest from Redmond Law, Cornelius Neal, Redmond, Mr. Redmond, I'll be in touch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a call, you. and uh, and uh, I have some things I want to share with you on a, on another call. Maybe we can get together again next week. Absolutely, thanks a lot. I appreciate right. it. Absolutely, have a great rest of the day. You Thank too. You. Take care.